Thank you. Um, forgive me for speaking in English. Is that too loud? It's, no, it's okay. Right. Um, I will be very quick because I know we want to get on to the substantive discussions about the economic crisis with uh, Bob Brenner and, and Robin. Uh, I just want to say on behalf of all the NLR editors that the review owes a great deal to Carlos Prieto and to the comrades of Traficantes dos Sueños, David Gámez, Beatriz Garcia and Iñaki Vaquez in particular. The Hispanic world has always been a region of vital concern to the international left and a region of vital interest to New Left Review from its earliest days. The journal was born in the year of the Cuban Revolution and one of Robin's first acts as an NLR editor was to go to Cuba and to participate in the revolution and to study its history. New Left Review published Regis Debray's writings on Latin America in the time of Che Guevara and also published Che himself. It analyzed the Latin American dictatorships, the revolution in Central America, the passages to democracy and the rise of the new New Left, interviewing Subcomandante Marcos and Rafael Correa. Spain, too, has been a central concern. Robin has discussed the contributions of Ronald Fraser, who was a central part of New Left Review. The journal also published sharp critical analyses of the transition from Francoism by Patrick Camilla, who argued that the Communist Party and PSOE could have extracted a much more democratic and republican constitution from the Suarez regime than the free enterprise monarchy for which they settled. The Hispanic world has always been very important to NLR, but we never dreamt it would be possible to publish the review in Spanish. The Spanish edition is now 15 years old, and its existence is entirely due to Carlos Prieto. In 1999, Carlos came banging at the door of the NLR office and explained his idea of publishing the review in Spanish with the backing at that stage of the ACAL publishing group. We were delighted, but we were very skeptical. To produce a review takes a great deal of work and it's very difficult to make any money out of it. But Carlos made it happen. The numbers started appearing one after another and a website soon appeared too. And when the arrangement with Akal came to an end, Carlos set up a new agreement with the comrades of Traficantes de Sueños and with the backing of the Instituto de Altos Estudios Nacionales of Ecuador and with the Secretaria de Educación Superior in Quito. Over the past 15 years, since the Spanish NLR has been in existence, the Hispanic world has become even more central to the international left. Latin America has produced the most serious opposition to the neoliberal consensus, proof that there is space for some alternative. It is the only region in which a group of states has moved distinctly to the left, propelled by the electoral victories of genuinely radical parties in Venezuela, Bolivia and Ecuador. And they have held out a hand of solidarity to Cuba, the only ex-Comicon country which has tried to retain its social gains while negotiating the post-Soviet world. For all the problems of the ALBA countries, some of them self-inflicted, 
They have been a beacon to the world as governments that have aimed to put the interests of the majority of their citizens before those of international capital. Since 2011, Spanish protesters have also been at the forefront of European efforts to contest the capitalist solution to the crisis. In these conditions, international debate and exchange become even more urgent. Thanks to Carlos and to Traficantes, to the Institute in uh, Quito and to the Secretariat there, NLR has had the means to engage in these debates. This achievement, I would say, also is due in good part to the personal qualities <laughs> of our comrade Carlos, who combines a powerful intellectual passion with a profound dedication to the cause of radical social change, as well as great personal warmth and tremendous energy. Without him, this could really never have happened. Carlos, gracias. <laughs> I want to thank Carlos and the comrades of Traficantes for having arranged this uh, event, uh, which we're delighted to be present at. Uh, what I've set myself is the impossible task in 15 minutes of conveying 50 years of uh, themes, preoccupations of the New Left Review. Uh, and um, I think as I do that, I, I feel that the, the magazine is better today than it's ever been. Uh, but I think it's also recognizably the same journal, changing what has to be changed, of course, uh, as the journal that came out and was relaunched in, in exactly 50 years ago in, in 1964. Uh, and so what I'd like to do is just give a quick run through or evoke some of the um, approach to the world that was developed within the corpus of the New Left Review over those years. Uh, to begin with, capitalism. Capitalism has always been a central preoccupation of the journal, and it sometimes surprised us in one way or another, but we've always had a pretty steady focus on it. And I should say that um, that perhaps doesn't sound uh, very exciting or original today, but it's interesting that in 1960, when the journal came, first came out, or 65, there was a widespread belief, for example, among the thinkers of the British Labour Party that capitalism uh, no longer existed. It, it was sort of industrial society and um, uh, we didn't have to worry about capitalism anymore. Well, I'm glad to say we did worry about it and that's been a constant theme and we've had writers, well of course we're going to be hearing from uh, Bob Brenner, Robert Brenner, uh, whose work has provided a focus of debate and who uh, was already uh, publishing in 1998 the study warning that uh, the big one was really coming. Um, Andrew Glynn, Ernest Mondell, well really countless others have uh, uh, contributed to these debates. Another thing that I think is characteristic of the journal is the country studies. Uh, we've done uh, 50 or 55 country studies and eventually we'll get round to covering every country on the planet. Uh, really the idea here is to be comparative, to be specific. Uh, although we believe in capitalism and class struggle, it isn't the same everywhere. It's fought out in local conditions with history and memory and um, it's important uh, to be aware of distinctions. Um, the country studies started off with uh, the Nairn Anderson thesis, that's Tom Nairn and Perry Anderson, uh, writing about what was peculiar in the crisis of British capitalism of the early 1960s. And so that was a focus on what was specific and it opened a great debate with Edward Thompson uh, uh, and other uh, 
writers on the British left, and it reverberates down even to recent times, with Tom then warning that Ukania, the United Kingdom, that it was going to break up, and it is indeed breaking up. Although, of course, as always, it's not doing so quite as rapidly as one would have thought. One wouldn't have thought one had to wait 50 years, but it seems to be happening still. Another theme was that of nations and nationalism, which sort of develops really logically from a, uh, an interest in the specific conjuncture uh, in particular countries. And um, uh, once again, we have Nan Anderson theses, but really it's a different Anderson. It's, it's Benedict Anderson, Perry's brother, who responded to uh, a, a, an amazing article in the mid-70s by Tom Nan uh, 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 on the Janus-faced character of nationalism, seeing it as having democratic potential as well as reactionary potential. And Benedict Anderson took up this idea and developed it further in his imagined communities with its exploration of the role of print capitalism in creating the context for national awareness and national consciousness. Uh, once again, this was a topic uh, which was to grow wider and deeper in its realms of interest. And once again, uh, a senior figure of the British Marxist left uh, couldn't really agree with either Nairn or Anderson. Uh, I'm thinking of Eric Hobsbawm, and his work on nation and nationalism was partly a response to Edward, uh, to Nairn and, uh, and Benedict Anderson. Uh, Another topic that uh, the NLR didn't publish as much on as it would have liked, uh, and perhaps it should have done, but which it did publish very, and has always published important articles on, is that of sex and gender with Juliet Mitchell writing uh, Women, the Longest Revolution in 1966, which really anticipated the second wave of feminism. And right up to the most recent times, Susan is now publishing Nancy Fraser, evaluating that whole period of 50 years of women's movements and women's struggles. Uh, uh, uh. David Fernback wrote on um, gay sexuality. Uh, actually, only two or three other articles on that in the entire 50-year period, but it's a wonderful article. It's a real cracker, uh, and I can thoroughly recommend it. Um, so although we're sometimes, you know, don't publish as much as we ought to or would like, uh, it, it, it can still be redeemed by, uh, you know, quality. Uh, socialism, the working class, the new left, uh, this is an area uh, of natural preoccupations and, and uh, we, we had the help in documenting the real conditions of workers, for example. Uh, something that uh, Ronnie Fraser, Ronald Fraser, who was also a distinguished historian of Spain, he published a sequence of altogether about 40 essays on workers' experience of work. And uh, André Gortz, another powerful contributor uh, to the NLR, uh, who wrote his goodbye to the working class, we didn't quite agree with that, but many of his green socialist uh, ideas did seem to be very worthwhile, and he was a very valued, although not very frequent, contributor. Um, war and Peace. I think really the journal has been more defined by its reaction to uh, wars than almost anything else. The journal did begin uh, as really a current uh, link to the campaign for nuclear disarmament of the, early, uh, of the late uh, 1950s and early 1960s. Uh, it's uh, preoccupation with nuclear weapons uh, and, and nuclear d destruction continued with uh, up the most recent times articles by Norman Dombey and by Susan, the editor. 
Uh, and of course, anti-imperialism, that's been a powerful theme within uh, concern with war and peace. And outstanding contributor here uh, has been Tariq Ali with his prescient articles about Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, which is also written up in best-selling books. Uh, so his contribution has been very important. And I just would like to mention the recent writings of Patrick Coburn, long interview with Patrick in the, uh, 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 on the occupation of unoccupied Iraq, uh, uh, which he developed later into a book. Uh, and he's continued with writings on the very latest developments in Iraq and Syria uh, and Kurdistan, um, including published in London Review's books as well as in the, the NLR. So that's uh, an important part. And really, the, the country study approach had an anti-imperial or anti-eurocentric thrust to it. So the reviewers tried to be interested in uh, all sorts of different parts of the globe long before globalization. Culture critique, tremendously important. I can't really say anything about it except Frederick Jameson, postmodernism, and all the discussion that that aroused, and at an early stage in the development of that argument. Soviet Union, well, I'm now coming to something which, uh, like the youth movement of the 60s, deeply influenced the review. The movement of 68 uh, gave a new impetus to the NLR. Uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union was something, uh, uh, I mean, it saddened, but it didn't surprise us. And uh, we'd had Zorish Medvedev and Isaac Deutscher warning about what would, was likely to happen. Uh, 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 but the consequences of it, the causes of it, have been a, con a, a deep concern uh, for the magazine over all those 50 years. And really, as the new left, it emerges partly out of that crisis of socialism and of Stalinism. Uh, China, um, a very large number of amazing articles about China with uh, uh, a member of the editorial committee, Wang Chao Hua, and Lin Chun, a historian of Britain's New Left, uh, contributing to uh, us to, to furthering the understanding of what's going on in China. Uh, experience, well, once again, Ronnie Fraser explored subjectivity. He wrote an autobiography. He did wonderful books uh, with the mayor of Mijas and other, the Spanish Civil War, uh, interviewing those on both sides of that conflict. Uh, so the, the sense that experience, uh, uh, it's a weight within the magazine, important there. Theory, the NLR has always been identified as interested in theory and committed to it. Although actually we only publish one or two articles per issue on that topic. But a uh, current issue has Gopal Balakrishnan on Marx, and I think that's quite characteristic. Uh, uh, Zizek, uh, we've been happy to publish, uh, uh, especially when he's um, uh, very much on target, which um, I think he was in his Parallax View, um, important article that appeared first in NLR. And then I've just finally left to last ecology where we've published one or two good pieces but really not the range of articles that we would have liked or that it would have been ideally nice to have published. However, Mike Davis who's been an outstanding contributor to the journal from the United States, uh, also sometimes based in London, he recently published uh, a commanding text on the perspectives of the uh, Green movements and um, uh, their significance significance and importance for the future of the left. So there you have it, 50 years in I think 16 minutes.